Shalom, Shalom, Kahala Yahweh, Baha Shem, Yahweh Shai, Baha Shem, Rekha Kadash, Dabon to the Apostles and Elders Great Millstone and Will, and salutations to the hopeful elect on the four corners of the earth, pushing a word in the name of the Most High and truth in its sincerity. This is Iraq from Great Millstone, Wisconsin. And what I have on the screen here is a documentary from Muckracker. And I got this uh, documentary, which is a very good documentary, by the way, um, from Elder from Elder Mike Allah out in LA, and um, also as well as uh, Elder Barack Abar um, from GMS Awakening, one for four out of New York. Now, um, this documentary is a very good documentary. This documentary exposes the migrant or the immigration route from Ecuador and Central America, well no, South America, Salakia, all the way up to um, the Gulf of Mexico. And through this documentary, I'm not I'm not really gonna play it um, because I have the uh, the screen record. I don't want the video to get blocked. But through this video, um, you had a couple of guys. Um, I believe you know they might be eating mites, might not be eating mites. I don't know. Um, you know they look uh, uh, they have olive skin, so you know who knows. But anyway, um, the the video basically what it does it's a vi it's a video log of their trek through the migrant route because what they did was they flew to south america and they took this route on foot that jake takes from south and central america all the way up to the united states and what they found were migrant stations that were juiced in with chinese uh, the moabites with with indians the elamites with koreans you know, with uh, people from Europe, and they and all of this is funded. Actually, this isn't by chance. This isn't a migration that happened to happen just because um, you know people are poor and they want to come up to America to live. Now, you do have people, you know, you do have people that are poor that want to come to America for a better life. Yes, you know, but as you know, and it might have, most of them are in the group. But within the group, is you have. Um, UNICEF and UN agents that are making their way to America through this pipeline that are being aided by the cartels in the area, you know, the drug cartels in the area. So basically what's happening is that the United Nations are paying the cartels to fund this, this, uh, this um, migrant route all the way up to America. And they have hotels for the Chinese to stay, they have they have they have two hotels for the Chinese to stay. Um, they have UNICEF and very various United Nations organizations that are helping uh, funding and help aid these people come up to the United States. And as they were trying to interview certain you know certain people, you know what country are you from? What country are you from? Um, you know what's your destination? Um, things of that nature. You had certain people that would not respond. You know you had certain people that would say yes yes uh, I'm going to America. Or, you know, hey, I'm from Ecuador, or I'm from Honduras, or, you know, um, I'm from China. You know what I'm saying? At one point in the documentary, you know, they had a guy from China actually say that there was Chinese policemen in the United States, you know? So you have these United Nations and these agents from these other countries sneak coming into the country by this migrant pipeline, you know, that are sleeper cells in the United States that are really going to cause... Um, civil unrest. And all this is a ploy to destabilize uh, Babylon as a whole. You know, reason being is because when you have migrants coming to the country that don't have social security, that don't have um, proper documentation, what's going to happen is they're going to be put on uh, welfare, you know, and be taken care of by the government, which is going to put the government um, in a stretch of funds, which is going to limit their ability to limit their ability to pay down their debt, you know? And that's going to that's going to put strains on each type of um each type of social service, such as policemen and firemen and you know, and things of that nature. And, you know, they already have uh people that vote that are immigrants. You know, you can now vote, you can now become police officers as illegal immigrants and they're more accepting of it. But it's pushing it's it's pushing this putting a strain on the social economic services of the country, you know, and I just want to go here 
to something called the Cloward Pivot Strategy. Now, this is something that I got from a comment from, uh, you know, Barack, Elder Barack Abar's video um, from GMS Awakening 144. And it was one of the first, it was the first comment on the video. I think it was pinned. And it's called the Cloward Pivot Strategy. So I went ahead and looked this up. And it says, Cl the Cloward Pivot Strategy is a political strategy outlined in 1966 by American sociologists and political activists Richard Cloward and Francis Fox Piven. It is a strategy of forcing political change, right? It says, force political change leading to social collapse through orchestrated crisis, you know? Now, so they're basically, they're basically forcing a crisis with this immigration pipeline. It says the Cloward Piven strategy seeks to hasten the fall of capitalism by overloading the government bureaucracy with a flood of impossible demands, amassing massive unpayable national debt, you know? So these, these impossible demands are impossible, um, impossible uh, populations of migrants being on welfare, man, you know? Amassing massive unpayable debt because they won't be able to pay it, right? And other methods such as unfettered immigration, which that's exactly what this is, man. Unfettered immigration, meaning free immigration. You know, there are no change or no restrictions put on our immigration laws, you know. It says, and push, that's pushing society into crisis and economic collapse by overwhelming the system, you know. Now it says unpayable national debt, right? Now let's see what the debt clock is. Let's see. So right now, this debt clock is at thirty-four trillion, one hundred ten billion, nine hundred thirty-six million. Now nine hundred thirty-seven million dollars, man. You know, and it's climbing at an astronomical rate. You know, this is how far this debt ceiling has gone. Now let's look at some of these social services. You know. Largest budget items, Medicare and Medicaid. Now, this is what's taken out of your check, you know, every time you get paid in order to fund this uh, social service, which, you know, um, for disability and Social Security and things of that nature, you know, for, uh, for social services. So, you know, you get old, you get disabled, you know, you apply for Social Security and Medicaid and government send you a check every month, you know. Now, look at Social Security. This is up to a trillion dollars. Medicaid, up to a trillion dollars, you know. So, the, and these are climbing astronomically is, uh, uh, along with the U.S. national debt, man, you know? So it says, now let me go back to, now it's supposed to be a weight of the poor, a strategy to end poverty. But we all know this is really a strategy to overload the system and cause the system uh, to go into massive uh, unrest, man, you know? I just want to go really quick into let's see now i'll just start from it from the top it says strategy cloward and pivot's article is focused on forcing the dominican democratic party which in 1966 controlled the presidency and both houses of the united states congress to take federal action to help the poor false they stated that full enrollment of those eligible for welfare will produce bureaucratic disruption in welfare agencies and fiscal disruption in local and state governments and this is what this is causing, you know, because there are too many funds going out and not enough funds coming in. And that's only going to increase through this pipeline, you know. It says, it's like it. it says it would deepen existing divisions among elements in the big city democratic coalition, the remaining white middle class, the working class, ethnic groups, and the growing minority poor. So it's causing more division more now than ever. It says to avoid a further weakening of that historic coalition, the National Democratic Administration will be constrained to advance a federal solution to poverty that would override local welfare failures, local class and racial conflicts, and local revenue dilemmas. Which basically, you know, when you come down here, it's called they call it they called it a redistribution of income, which is all this is is universal basic income. So. They're using the mig migrants to collapse the socioeconomic system in Babylon 
in order to implement this universal basic income, which is all going to be tied to the chip. Because best believe, you know, all these immigrants and, and all these ethnic groups, you know, beside, and I'm talking about besides Jake, you know, besides Israelites that go on this welfare, they're going to be implemented into the into the chip, man, you know, and this the end all be all. So this is all an elaborate plan to just chip everybody, you know, to bring everybody under control. So they bring in the chaos and they're going to bring what they think is order, you know. Now, if, you know, that's not enough information for you, I found this video on YouTube and this video on YouTube goes into the Cloward Piven strategy on what they did to Jake, you know. So I'm just going to play it really quick. Who left and, and almost specifically... Uh... Uh, one of the professors in this building, Francis Fox Piven, and Richard Cloward in their book, Regulating the Poor and in their movement, as a almost prime movers in this disintegration of the black community in one sense, and the rise of this this feeling or this, this paradigm of therapeutic alienation. Francis Fox Piven and Richard Cloward created so much black pain, and it's really a shame how little this is known. It, it's very simple. The idea that there could be a kind of welfare policy where generation after generation stayed on it, nobody cared whether the people got a job and you were paid for having kids, didn't exist until the late 60s. A lot of people seem, understandably, to think that that's the way welfare always was. It was that way for a good 30 years. That only started then. There's a reason why when you read a novel about the black poor in, in say, the 1930s or 40s, that welfare is generally mentioned once or twice. It was hard to get on. It barely paid you enough to eat. And social workers were always trying to mm -hmm. get you off it. And this counted for whites as well as blacks. So there's more I'm talking about welfare as a racial issue in the 30s or 40s. But starting in the late 60s, welfare was expanded by those Columbia social workers. Their idea was benevolent. They were trying to create a guaranteed income, but that didn't happen. And it left black communities where it was possible to spend your life, if you were a woman, living on welfare, and to spend your life making children you didn't have to take care of if you were a man. You couldn't do that in 1958 because the government wasn't going to take care of the kids. So the issue is not that black people were somehow evil to go on the welfare. If it was offered, of course, about every third person took it. That's human nature. But if that welfare hadn't existed, the black community today would be much more coherent than it was. There's no such thing as whole communities where having a father was strange until welfare was changed that way it was see what he says that there was no community such community where it was strange to to have a father until welfare was in play you know there were no statistics on not having on not on, on broken family homes you know so they're breaking these homes on purpose to put jake on and you know their own people the Edom, the edomites on welfare to push the debt up to collapse the system and hopefully, you know, they, or not hopefully, but they want to create a universal basic income. That's exactly what he's saying, you know? One of the most important aspects of black history, what those people did to welfare legislation, although it should also be said that it was spearheaded by George Wiley, who was mm -hmm. black, mm -hmm. but still. Yeah, see, they used Jake to advocate for this, just like they used Jake to advocate for the civil rights movement. It was a grievous. Which brought in the alphabet people, by the way grievous wrong and the people involved in that even today the ones who are alive have blood on their hands and they had a more profound effect on the black community across this country than factories moving away or anybody using the word nigger or any of the other things that we're trained to think more about so like you but yeah so so you know and Poor jake just summed it up you know they used that strategy to create welfare to break the homes and to you know to uh, put, you know, Jake on welfare, you know, and, and these other uh, ethnic groups on welfare. And what they did was push the debt ceiling up. And now they want a universal basic income, you know. And I was looking at one of the, one of the comments here. And I probably, probably can't find it. It probably hit it. But basically, there was a guy that commented, and he basically said, um, you know, that they didn't understand or that, no, that people don't understand that, um, that, you know, these ethnic groups of people that were on welfare would be ostracized and would be, you know, basically put at the bottom of the barrel 
for um, American society, but I can't find it anymore, so I'm just gonna move on. But yeah, so this is what's happening to America, man. You know, and America is systematically falling, you know, from being that golden cup, you know. So ultimately, this is the Lord's doing, but he's using um, these other nations to, to cripple America in a way that America won't be able to fight back, you know. When, that, when we talk about that sedition among men, this martial law that's going to happen, it's not going to just happen just by, um, just by you know, enforcing the, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the microchip, you know or the the or the um the pestilence you know it's going to happen by sleeper cells you know waking up and causing havoc all over this country you know and martial law is going to have to be implemented to stop these to stop these uh migrant uh soldiers man these migrant sleeper cells you know that's another aspect this is jeremiah 51 and 7 it says babylon hath been a golden cup in the lord's hand that made all the earth drunken right so you know, and that Clif the Clif the Cloward Piven strategy was created in the 1960s, right? Now, 1960s, the Roaring 60s, was the golden age of America, where America made the most money. You know what I'm saying? It said the nations have drunk enough of wine, therefore the nations are mad because the nations started to wake up, man. You know, it says Babylon is suddenly fallen and destroyed. You know, because all of this. It's causing financial strain on this place, man, you know, on top of the infrastructure breaking down, you know, on top of the dollar being, um, you know, the, the, uh, demonetized, you know, and all these things that we see happening in the news now today. It says, how for her take balm for her pain? If so, she may be healed, you know? So they're, and they're actually trying to save this place. They're trying to put policies in place to heal, to heal the economic system of America. But it's not happening. It's not working, you know, and they're confused on why it's not working because the other nations are systematically working against America, just like America worked against these other nations on various points throughout history. It says we would have it's all a covert operation, man, you know, by a coalition of nations. It says we would have healed Babylon, but she is not healed. Forsake her and let us go everyone into his own country. You know, and this is where you have my immigrants fleeing the country, man, you know, taking their money out of this place, leaving and going back home, you know, finding their families and fleeing to other countries, you know, for her judgment reaches unto heaven and is lifted up even to the skies. And this is the reason why this is happening to this place, because her judgment is great. You know, she's piled on iniquity upon iniquity upon iniquity, man, you know. And as this happens, you know, as these migrants and these migrant soldiers come into the country, guess what's happening? America, just like Rome, is sending their troops overseas in mass quantities, leaving the homeland, so to speak, unguarded. So these people are sneaking in, and when they hit the uh, when they hit that button and activate these people, it's gonna be hell on earth in this place. You know, uh, just look at the movie of uh, Red Dawn, man. You know, Red Dawn is a is a great example. The uh, the old one with Patrick Swayze, and uh, the new one that came out I think in like what, 2012, 2013 or something like that. You know, where in the old in the old Red Dawn they used the Russians, you know, as the uh, sleeper cell soldiers. In the new Red Dawn they used the Chinese. You know. So let me go here, and this is Second Ezra chapter sixteen, and thirty three. It says, the virgin shall mourn, you know, the young women, having no bridegrooms, right? Because they're all going to be overseas and being put to death in the wars, man. It says, the women shall mourn, having no husbands, right? Because the husbands are going to go too. Their daughters shall mourn, having no helpers. In the war shall their bridegrooms be destroyed because all of the men are going to be flown overseas, man. You know, eventually, as we're on the cusp of World War III, there's going to be a draft, you know? And all of the men, uh, military-aged males, are going to be overseas fighting, man. Oh, and that's another thing. And that's what I forgot to mention. You know, this United States invasion route, right? One thing that the guy, the guy that, uh, that risked his life to take this route, this, this dangerous route here, is that he noticed that all of the men or all of the people that were coming into the country or, coming, or going through the pipeline were military-aged males, you know, 
there were more military aged males than children and women, you know, and that's a big problem because when this place is left defenseless and those men are activated, this place is going to go up in flames. It says, and the bridegroom shall be destroyed and their husbands shall perish of famine, you know, because there's there going to be no food, you know. Hear now these things and understand them, ye servants of the Lord. Behold, the Lord, behold the word of the Lord, receive it. Believe not the powers of whom the Lord spake. Behold, the plagues draw nigh and are not slack, you know, and this is the point. The plagues draw nigh and are not slack, which, which encompass destruction, the sword, famine, pestilence, and death, you know. And that's what's on the, that's on the horizon for this place, man, you know. Because one thing is that the elites, you know, the elites want to cripple this place. The elites want to cripple the world to bring about that new world order, man, that order out of chaos. But guess what, though? The Lord overall is what's doing it, you know, to this place and all around the world. He's crippling the world. He's using the elites to cripple the world, man, you know, to the left-hand side. This second Ezra chapter 15, verse 15, it says, For the sword and their destruction draweth nigh, and one people shall stand up and fight against another, and swords in their hands. And that's the point, you know. So you're not only going to get uh, civil unrest from the people fighting each other for, for food and for, for supplies and things of that nature, but you're going to have these, these sleeper cell soldiers being provocateurs and fighting the people as well, man, you know. It says, for there shall be sedition among men. And sedition means uprisings. So there's going to be multiple uprisings, multiple different ways. You know, you got the migrant soldiers. You got uh, the militia that's going to be created, that's being created now with the Americans, with the, with everyday American civilians. And not to, not to, uh, and not even to count the militias that's going to be made by, you know, other ethnic groups and other nations in this place, you know. Then you got the, the martial law and the government troops, you know, and then you have the police and other branches of the military that aren't active. They're going to form their own cliques and militias. So this is going to be a crazy battle, you know, it says and invading one another. Right. They shall not regard their kings nor princes. So the government structure is going to be totally dismantled and the course of their action shall stand in their power. You know, and I, I always use the example of um, the movie World War Z, you know, in the movie World War Z, um, you know, with Brad Pitt, they were in a grocery store and, and his wife was on the verge of getting taken or possibly raped. And the policeman was running into the running into the uh, to the grocery store and she's yelling at the policeman for help. And he came and grabbed his grabbed milk for his baby and left, you know. There's going to be no protection for these people out here. That's a foreshadow to come. It says, a man shall desire to go into a city and shall not be able, right? Because the cities are going to be barricaded. There's not only going to be civil unrest like, you know, like the movie The Siege with Denzel Washington, but there's also going to be pestilences and quarantines, you know, like the movie Contagion. And I believe, was that Matt Damon or Mark Wahlberg? Oh, no, no, Mark Wahlberg was in Contraband. Contagion was with uh, Matt Damon, you know. It says, for because of their pride, the city shall be troubled, the houses shall be destroyed, and the men shall be afraid. A man shall have no pity upon his neighbor, but shall destroy the houses with the sword and spoil their goods because of the lack of bread and for great tribulation. And this is exactly what you're going to see, man. This is going to be a movie, you know. Everything you see on the movie screens of what's being brought out today um, with predictive programming, we're going to see this in with our very own eyes, man. You know, you know. So with that, you know, I just, uh, you know, I thought it was going to be quicker than you know, 25 minutes, but you know, the spirit had to go a little bit longer. You know, but with that, you know, I, hey, man, it's heating up and it's going to get hotter. You know, and you know, Lord willing, you know, that we're a part of the elect, and the Lord protects us from these things because the elect aren't going to be a part of what's going to happen in this place, man. The Lord, the elect, Lord elect is going to be protected. You know, scriptures say that my servant shall eat, you know, so, you know, as long as we have faith in the Lord and keep doing his will, we'll be protected, you know, so with that, you know, I hope, you know, Akiyama and Akwas will edify through the spirit and power of Yahweh Shai. 
I want to give all praises, call Allah, Yahweh, by Hashem, Yahweh Shai, by Hashem, Hakudash, to my honors to the apostles and the elders, great millstone rule well, and salutations to the elect, hopeful elect, Slakia, on the four corners of the earth, pushing the word in the name of the Lord and truth and in sincerity. Shalom.